Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that this finds you and your family doing well today. I want to thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. It is my special privilege to be interviewing Ken Ham today. Ken is the founder, uh, president, CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter. I imagine most, if not all of you who watch my channel, know who Ken is, and uh, it's been a special privilege of mine to be able to meet him on a few occasions, uh, have a couple of meals with him, and uh, I can honestly tell you he's a genuinely, genuinely nice guy, and so it's a privilege for me to be able to interview you. Ken, how are you doing today? Hey, Justin, I'm doing real well. I didn't even pay you to say that. No, you did not, <laughs> and you didn't know I was going to say it either. That's true. <laughs> But uh, I mean, every word of it, you're a really nice guy. I think the world of you, Ken, I appreciate so much what um, you and all of the fine folks at AIG are, are doing. It's a, it's a great, great ministry. Oh, thanks, Justin. And we appreciate your stand. It's great to be able to work with others who are like-minded in regard to God's word. And that's uh, so special. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Well, Ken, I must tell you, as we get started, I, I called Ray Comfort last night and uh, we had a nice little conversation, and I said, uh, Ray, I'm, I'm interviewing Ken Ham on my YouTube channel tomorrow, and, and he said, Ken who? And then I said, y you know, Ken Ham, the, the, the Ark Encounter Creation Museum guy, he said, oh, oh, he said, he said, isn't that the guy that built a big boat with a bunch of wood that's millions of years old from New Zealand? That's what he said to me. <laughs> well, he always likes to harass me, calling it a boat, because he knows... We don't like the word boat when talking about the ark, it's ship. And actually, it's interesting that uh, Ray and I talk to each other every day by text, and we try to insult each other. See, one of the things about an Australian, <laughs> Australians like to insult their friends. I mean, that's how you tell them you like them. Right. And so if you insult them, you like them. So uh, Ray and I try to out-insult out each other every day. So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Americans might not understand that, but anyway. Right. Right. Well, I, ju I just sent him a, a, a fridge mag magnet for his refrigerator, and it's uh, Judge Judy saying something to him. But uh, anyway, oh, funny. We we do we do funny things all the time. So yeah, and I'm yeah. always talking about how short he is and how small he is, and right <laughs> that he must have a really small brain, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious yeah well that's so good i'm so glad y'all have such a good friendship that's uh that's heartwarming and and uh two compatriots in the gospel so i, I appreciate both you and ray ray's a, a great guy super super nice guy so all right well ken um so here in the last i don't know year or so there have been some within uh even conservative theological circles that have tried to say well it's uh, you can interpret Genesis 1 um, as not being six literal 24-hour day periods and still be faithful to Scripture. You can still be a conservative evangelical, even if you don't take Genesis 1 literally. Uh, what would your reply to those folks be, Ken? Well, it's interesting. You know, um, I've had people say to me, look, they have this system of dividing up uh, your beliefs into different tiers. You know, there's a first tier and a second tier and so on. And they say, you know, when it comes to, you know, dealing with issues of age and the days of creation, it's not a first tier issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, not like, you know, if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, then, then you've got a big problem um, because that means Christianity is gone, you know. Right. Um, but if, what I say to them is, is biblical authority a first tier issue? Because mm -hmm. if the Bible is not the authoritative word of God, uh, then we've got a problem. Yep. And yep. therefore, biblical authority is a first-tier issue. And that means taking God at his word. Uh, one of the things that you'll find is that people who believe in millions of years, they're not getting it from Scripture, they're getting it from outside of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they're not taking those days as ordinary days has nothing to do with what Scripture actually says. Right. They're really reinterpreting those days because of their belief in millions of years. I'll, I'll guarantee that people who question the days of creation have been impacted by outside ideas. Now, if you just take Genesis as written and you take the words there in Genesis chapter 1 
And for each of the six days of creation, you have the Hebrew word yom, whenever it's qualified by evening or morning mm -hmm. or number or night, it means an ordinary day. Now, right. you'll find for the first day, and actually the first day, the way it's written actually says one day. It's actually defining the word day. And you've mm -hmm. got yom with evening, morning, number, and night. And then for each of the other days, you've got evening, morning, and number. It's as if God is saying, I'm going to qualify this over and over and over and over again. Because if, yeah. if the word yom is with a number, it means an ordinary day. If it's with the right. word evening, it means an ordinary day. Or the word morning, it means an ordinary day. Or the word night, it means an ordinary day. Or if it's just the phrase evening and morning, it means an ordinary day. And so God's qualifying it over and over again. I think he's saying, you know, these people in the 21st century are going to be so thick. I'm going to qualify this over and over again. And they're still not going to believe it because they don't want to believe my word. And you see, it really right. relates to an issue of biblical authority because if you are starting outside of Scripture and then going to Scripture and reinterpreting the words of Scripture, you're undermining the authority of the Word, which then I would say is a first-tier issue, because that's what it's all about. And the reason I take those days as ordinary days is because I start from Scripture first. And Justin, you know, uh, you, would, you would be very familiar with the fact there's a big difference between exegesis and eisegesis. And really what's happening in much of the church in regard to Genesis is these people that are really doing eisegesis, starting outside of Scripture. And yet for so many of them, once you get through Genesis chapter 11, then they're prepared to do eisegesis for the rest of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And why is it only the first 11 chapters that there's a big problem, and particularly when it comes to issues of the days of creation and age? And I think a lot of it has to do with intimidation by the world, uh, there's a lot of academic peer pressure. If you believe in six literal days and a young earth and universe, you'll be called anti-intellectual, anti-academic, anti-scientific. Yeah. You won't be published in the journals or papers. The right. peer pressure is immense. There's a lot of academic pride out there, intellectual pride. And so uh, people tend to succumb. And, you know, it's a sad thing because when you have taught generations in the church or generations of pastors, you don't have to take Genesis as written. You can start outside Genesis and take man's beliefs and reinterpret what the Bible says. Then eventually, once you've unlocked that door, why shouldn't that happen with marriage? Oh, by the way, it is happening. Uh, yes. When we see even pastors becoming soft on the gay marriage issue and LGBT yeah. issues and transgender issues and so on. And then I just want to add this, and that is, when you believe in millions of years, it came out of atheism, atheism of the early 1800s particularly, and the belief that the fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man, those fossil layers are full of dead things that sh show evidence of diseases like cancer and arthritis and abscesses. You're saying all that existed before sin. And yet right. the Bible says after God made everything, everything was very good. You can't have millions of years of death, disease, and suffering before sin. We're living in a groaning world, Romans 8.22, because of sin. Uh, it was once mm -hmm. perfect. Mm -hmm. It was once very good. Now it's groaning. One day there'll be a restitution, a restoration. What will be res restored to? Death, suffering, disease? No, the Bible says no more death, no more pain. In fact, death will be thrown into the lake of fire. And, you know, remember this too. Where does our seven-day week come from? It doesn't come from any astronomical observation. Yeah, a seven-day right. week comes yeah. from the Bible because God made everything in six days and rested for one, which is why when you read Exodus 20, verse 11, which is the basis of the fourth commandment, it says in six days God created everything, rested on the seventh day. Yeah. That's where the seven-day week comes from. So, you know, when I'm talking to atheists and I ask them, you know, do you believe in a seven-day week or you have a 10-day week or 11-day week or... You have a seven-day week? Oh, so you do believe the Bible because that's, that's, right. where it, that's where it comes from. So, no, it, it is real important to take God's Word as written. And that's what our ministry is all about. It's a biblical authority ministry. And, you know, people think oh, our main emphasis is the age of the earth or six literal days of creation. Our main emphasis is biblical authority mm -hmm. and the gospel. And when something undermines biblical authority, like the supposed millions of years belief, then we certainly deal with that. Yes, indeed. That's one of the things I appreciate so much about Answers in Genesis is that that's where you come from. Scripture is your authority, and we base our worldview upon that. Um, 
again, uh, there's people today who claim to be, again, claim to be theological conservatives, and they would say that the uh, the age of the earth is really not a big deal. And, and you hinted at it just a, a moment ago, but uh, if if you if you hold to millions of years, then that necessitates death before sin. Now, these people would say, well, you can still believe in the deity of Christ, the atonement on the cross, bodily resurrection. The gospel is still intact, even if you hold to uh, an old earth in millions of years. What would your response be to those folks? You know, what do we read in Scripture? If you confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead and believe in six literal days in a young earth, you'll be saved. Well, we know that we know that Scripture doesn't say that, right? Right. Uh, scripture says if you confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. In other words, is there anywhere in Scripture that says you have to believe in six literal days in a young earth to be saved? And the answer is no, it, it, it doesn't say that. Uh, then people say to me, so you can believe in millions of years and still be a Christian? And I say, well, I know a lot of Christians uh, that I believe that, you know, that we we'll have to accept their testimony, um, that they're born again and they trust Christ for salvation. Salvation is by grace that you're saved through faith, grace alone, faith alone. Uh, there's no addition to that in regard to, you know, mm -hmm. what you believe about the age of the earth or the days of creation. And then they'll say to me, so it doesn't matter then. I say, no, that's where you're wrong. It really does matter mm -hmm. because it really comes down to an issue of authority, biblical authority, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that is that when you believe in millions of years, you didn't get that from Scripture. You got that from outside of Scripture. You're mm -hmm. taking it to Scripture. And it's interesting that when you look at all the different positions on Genesis, I mean, throughout uh, church history, uh, there's been, particularly in modern times, particularly since the 1800s, there's been so many different positions on Genesis, gap theory, progressive creation, threshold evolution, framework hypothesis, theistic evolution, mm -hmm. day-age theory, local mm -hmm. flood. I mean, the, all these different positions. But, you know, they all have one thing in common. You know what that is? Believing in millions of years and trying yeah. to come up with some creative way of fitting it into the Bible should tell you right there there's a problem. You know, and people say to me, well, what's your position? And I say, oh, the biblical one. I just start uh, with the scriptures uh, as written. And see, the other thing is that I mentioned, if you believe in millions of years, you have to accept that the death, disease, suffering we see today has gone on for millions of years. And you know, that is an incredibly big issue because a lot of young people today, and, and in fact, a lot of people, uh, but the younger generations, one of the big issues to them is, how can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering we see in the world today? And if they go to church and they've been told by their Christian leader, their pastors, no, you can believe in millions of years, just trust in Jesus. But that means God's responsible for all this death and suffering and disease. Right. And mm -hmm. if it existed millions of years before man, he called it all very good because after God created man. He said everything he made was very good. So then we're blaming God for death, suffering, and disease, but the Bible blames our sin. That's, right. That's the important thing. And really, when you say God used death, bloodshed, disease, and suffering to bring man into existence, and he's responsible for all that death, it's an attack on the character of God. You know, you remember when yeah. Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and said, Jesus wept. I believe he was weeping at death, that you know, there was that separation because of death. And I believe he was angry at death because death was in the world because of our sin. And so what did he do? Lazarus come forth. He healed Lazarus from the dead. And, you know, the Bible makes it clear one day uh, in the new heavens, new earth, there'll be no more death and death is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Actually, what does the Bible call death in the New Testament? An enemy. Enemy. That's it's right. an intrusion, right? And That's so right. we need to make sure that we're blaming our sin for the judgment of death. You know, that's why uh, death is here. We rebelled. We committed high treason against the God of creation. It's not because God used death and suffering and disease to bring man to existence. So these these issues are very, very uh, important. And, you know, if death has always been here and then Jesus died on the cross, what has his death got to do with anything of paying the penalty for sin? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't That's add right. up. In fact, That's the right. first death, I believe, was recorded in the Bible in Genesis 3.21 when God 
uh, gave Adam and Eve coats of skins. So he would have killed animals. Yep. And really, that was the first blood sacrifice as a covering for their sin. We know that uh, people in the Old Testament, you know, Cain and Abel knew about the sacrificial system. There had to be a sacrifice, a payment for the mm -hmm. penalty of sin. But of course, it was looking forward to the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Um, and the life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood represents life. Mm -hmm. And so there had to be the giving of life to pay the penalty for sin, which means the shedding of blood, which pointed to the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice who shed his blood because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away our sin. Yeah. Uh, that was just a picture of what was to come in Christ and what he would do on the cross. Yes. Yes, indeed. Amen. Well said. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, Ken, there's also been a, a recent push for saying that the flood was a, just a localized event. Now, this is not a new idea, of course, but it's it seems to be um, at least a, a new idea within our theologically conservative circles. And uh, there's one individual in, in particular, but he argues, one of his arguments is that the the word in Hebrew for world, uh, when in Genesis 6, talks, talking about the flood and it covered the entire face of the earth, um, he says that that word earth, Eretz in Hebrew, is used elsewhere in other parts of scripture when it's simply referring to a localized area. For example, Genesis 13, 9 says, is not the whole land before you? And that word land is Eretz. So, you know, depending upon the context, it could mean the entire world, but it could mean, uh, he says it can also mean just a localized area. And so therefore, there's really no reason for us to believe that the flood was global. It was. It could have been just a a local flood based on Eretz. What would your reply to that be? You know, Justin, when you study uh, theological works and so on, if you study theology, what is one of the things they tell you? Uh, context, 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 context. context, context. context yep. Right? Uh, you know, we talked about the word yom before, the Hebrew word yom. Mm -hmm. And I've had, well, I remember an instance once where a pastor came to me and he said, but the word yom can mean something other than an ordinary day. And I said, that's true, but mm -hmm. it can also mean an ordinary day. Right. And he said, but it can mean something other than an ordinary day. I said, that's true, but it can also mean an ordinary day. And then he said it again. And I said, look, the point is not that the word yom can't mean something other than an ordinary day. It can. The point is it can mean day. And when does it mean day? That's the important thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the same with the word Eretz. If you look up the word Eric in a in a lexicon, you know, Hebrew dictionary, it's got a whole range of meanings. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide which one to pick? Uh, its first meaning is usually given as whole earth, by the way, and then it can have a meaning of land and parts of the land, and 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 you know, uh, it can have a meaning of of certain communities on the land or land, mm -hmm. you know, communities of mm -hmm. uh, in certain sections of the land, and so it goes on. And its context. And so let's look at the context there of the flood. Let me see. This sounds like a local flood to me, doesn't it? The highest hills under the whole of heaven were covered by water. <laughs> right. it, it, it doesn't make any sense to say that that was a, a local flood. No. But not only that, you know, at the end of the flood, what did God do? He said the rainbow, uh -huh. the rainbow, I'm making a covenant between uh, God and man and the animals. And the rainbow will be a sign of that covenant. So when you see the rainbow, I want you to remember that I will never again uh, destroy with such a flood. Now, we've seen lots of local floods since. So did God break mm -hmm. his promise or was it something mm -hmm. other than a local yep. flood? That's right. It was obviously uh, a global flood. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's a reference to the flood in Second Peter 3, talking about in the last days, the scoffers mm -hmm. who come and yep. uh, they'll reject creation. And then it says they'll reject that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, mm -hmm. and then they'll reject the coming judgment by fire. And it's interesting, the coming judgment by fire is talking about, you know, then a whole new heavens and a new earth. It's talking about the whole earth. And in the context of the, the flood there, the world that then was perished, uh, it's talking about the whole world, it's talking about the whole earth. It's very obvious it was a, a global flood. I mean, 
why would Noah build a, an ark for these animals if it was just a local flood? And it says all yeah. flesh that had the breath of life, all flesh right. died. Um, the scripture makes it very clear, even in the New Testament in, in uh, Peter, that only eight people survived the flood. And that's what it tells us uh, there in Genesis. And we also know when uh, at Noah and his wife and their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives came off the ark, then in Genesis 9, it tells us that those three sons gave rise to all the people mm -hmm. uh, on, on earth since that time. Yeah. Uh, and so there weren't any other people that survived the flood. There were only those eight, and all flesh died. And the, and the highest hills under the whole of heaven, it repeats that uh, there yeah. in those passages in Genesis 6. Uh, through nine concerning the flood and there's lots of other reasons we could talk about that no that had to be it was a global flood it was very obvious that it was a global flood uh, so you know as in the days of Noah so shall the coming of the son of man be are we going to have a localized uh, second coming and a localized judgment by fire in the future of course not right exactly exactly yeah, and a localized flood just brings up some absurdities, too. You said, you know, why would Noah build the ark? He could have just, you know, relocated the animals, gone a right. you know, 100 miles away or something like that. And and then you, I don't know if, did Lalo show you the picture that I texted to him right before the interview? That, oh, yes, that's one of the pictures that uh, I've used in my talks to show the oh. absurdity of a local flood. Oh, okay. So that that, that picture probably, it comes from you, huh? Yes, it comes from Ancestor okay. Genesis, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good to know. So, uh, yeah, it's just absolutely absurd. And it's, uh, Ken, you almost get the sense that, unfortunately, some of these folks, um, it, it seems like they're they're trying to accommodate Scripture. They're, they're, they're almost embarrassed by some of the miracles that the Bible records. And uh, it's like they're trying to gain a, a level of credibility amongst the world, you know, say, well, well we're not, as Christians, we're not we're not that crazy to believe that God would flood the entire planet or we're not that crazy to believe that, you know, the the world is only 6,000 or so years old. Is is that what we're seeing? A try, an attempt to a, make, yeah, make the it, Bible a little more palatable to the, to the world? Well, you know, particularly since the 1800s, we live in what's called a scientific age. And of course, in the 1800s, you also have the rise of naturalism uh, to, to, you know, combat uh, obviously, uh, biblical things. Um, and people today see the technology that we have, and there's been an incredible indoctrination that, you know, if, if you're scientific, uh, you would not believe in, in Genesis. And, you know, if you're scientific, you would believe in millions of years and you'll believe in evolution. And to be scientific means you can't believe that history or it, that it's not history in Genesis 1 to 11. And so there's an incredible peer pressure, intellectual, academic peer pressure out there uh, to reject uh, Genesis 1 to 11. And it's, you know, one of the things I often do is help people understand the word science comes from the Latin scientia, which means to know, it means knowledge, mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. that there's different sorts of knowledge. And knowledge gained using your five senses in the present what is what build our technology. And so it right. doesn't matter whether you're an atheist or a Christian, I, we can love science. I was approved to be a science teacher in the public schools in Australia as a Christian. So I must have fulfilled all the requirements yeah. to understand science. And right. you see, but when it comes to talking about origins, that's, that's your beliefs. That's different. That's a different sort of science. That's why I call them when I debated Bill Nye uh, in, in 2014, 10 years ago, actually, uh, I said we've got to understand the difference between observational science and historical science. We all agree on the observational science. It's the historical science, sure. your beliefs about the past, where we disagree. And unfortunately, I think many Christians today have been brainwashed into thinking if if, if I believe in Genesis 1 to 11 as literal history, I'm, I'm denying science, which is not true. And right. there's a lot of intellectual pride out there and academic pride because you will be scoffed at. You will be ostracized by your secular peers if you believe in six literal days in a young earth and a, and a global flood like we do, uh, which is what the Bible clearly teaches, by the way. Uh, they'll be ostracized yeah. by their peers. They won't be published in the journals. Right. And so, you know, and Genesis 1 to 11, it's interesting. 
I believe there's been an incredible attack on Genesis 1 to 11 in our time since the 18, 1800s because it is the foundation for everything. Mm -hmm. There's nothing it's not the foundation for. It's the yep. foundation for the rest of the Bible, for all of our doctrine. It's the foundation for the gospel. It's the foundation for our biblical worldview. It is the foundation for everything. And the devil knows that. Think about it. It's the foundation for marriage. It's the foundation yes. for gender. Mm -hmm. It's the foundation for understanding life, the sanctity of life. Yes. It's the foundation for work. It's the foundation for understanding true climate change, uh, which yeah. was produced by the flood and the yeah. Ice Age and mm -hmm. not the climate change religion they're talking about today, which is a worship of man and making right. man uh, his own God who can save the planet and so on. And so you see... Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. And that's why there's been such an attack on it. And sadly, so much of the church has succumbed to it. Yes, indeed. It really is sad. It really is sad. And I'm so grateful that you're out there and you have this wonderful ministry to equip believers to uh, speak the truth, speak the truth in love, be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. And um, yeah, y'all are doing such good work. If, if I may, Ken, let me ask you a, a couple of final questions sure. just about this area as far as origins and creation go. So this, these are a couple of questions that I'm posed uh, myself. I hear quite often. So if you hold to a six literal 24 hour day period and a young earth, then um, how, how do we explain all of these animals that are clearly designed as predators? Uh, for example, the, the alligator snapping turtle, he has this little pink tongue and he opens his mouth and wiggles. It looks like a worm and it draws fish in. And then he, you know, clamps down and has his lunch and, you know, the teeth of a great white shark, you know, it, it, they would say clearly these animals aren't, aren't designed to be vegetarians. So uh, if death did not come uh, before the fall, then why were these animals created to be predators? You know, Justin, um, let me make a statement. The present is not the key to the past. Mm -hmm. You see, secularists use the present as the key to the past, right? And that's really the basis for what they would call uniformitarianism. In other words, you look at present processes and then extrapolate into the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how the idea of millions of years came about. Oh, we see layers being laid down slowly today. Therefore, in the past, they must have always been laid down slowly. So all those layers you have all over the earth, if there really was a global flood, you'd find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth, and that's what you find. Right. So they couldn't be from the flood because they must have been laid down slowly over uh, millions of years. And, you know, um, since that time, of course, they, they say, oh, well, we do see some local catastrophes. So maybe there were some local catastrophes over time, but basically, it, it, you know, uh, what we see in present-day processes has gone on for millions of years. Now, we as Christians, unfortunately, tend to think like that too because we don't have a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. You see, you can't look at the present world to interpret the past. We need to start from the Word of God who knows everything, who's always been there, who's given us a record of what happened in the past so we can build a true biblical worldview to understand the present. Most churches don't teach biblical worldview. Uh, less than 6% of Christian schools teach biblical worldview. I'd say most Christians, mm. they think a biblical worldview is adding the Bible to your thinking and, you yeah. know, adding Bible verses to your thinking. Right. And that's why when they ask me about questions like dinosaurs, and by the way, I'm getting to the answer to the question. I just take a long time to answer sure. this question. But uh, that's why I had people say things like, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And I say, well, you don't. And they say, what do you mean you don't? No, you're starting with the present world and man's present interpretation of things, and you're saying, how do you fit that with the Bible? You start with the Bible that mm -hmm. gives us an account of the origin of land animals, the origin of death. It tells us about uh, Noah's Ark and so on. You've got to have the right history concerning the past to then understand the present world. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you look at fossils, you say, how do you fit fossils to the Bible? Well, you don't. Start with the Bible and you know there was no death before sin, so fossils weren't laid down before sin. The Bible tells us about a global flood. If there was such a flood, you'd find fossils all over the earth. Now, I say all that to say to us what people tend to do 
is look at the present world and they say, look, we see animals eating animals and, and we see them using their sharp teeth to eat animals and look at the great white shark. So how could there have been a no death before sin? I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's start with what the Bible says. Originally, when God made Adam and Eve, they ate uh, fruit. They were vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, uh, verse 29. Right. And then right. verse one, chapter 1, verse 30 says, the animals were eating plants. Now, if you jump over to Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, after the flood, God changed our diet as humans and said, just as I, I gave you the plants, now I give you the animals as well. Now you can eat everything, yeah. which I tell people is the reason you can eat a hot dog because it is everything. Uh, but <laughs> if, you, if you go back to Genesis 1, 29 and 30, if 29... Is talking about verse 29 is talking about man being vegetarian, substantiated by Genesis 9:3 mm -hmm. as well. Verse 30 is written in the same way for animals, they were obviously vegetarian. So the point I want to make is you can't start from an interpretation of what's happening today and say that doesn't fit with the Bible. We need to start from the Bible and say, oh, they weren't always like that. Oh, we're living in a fallen world. Romans 8, 22 tells us the whole of creation groans. And people say, but, but, but a great white shark has sharp teeth. Well, just because an animal has sharp teeth doesn't mean it's a meat eater. It just means it has sharp teeth. And you need sharp teeth if you're going to eat even plants and certain types of plants. You know, in Australia, we have uh, this little creature that goes around Australia. It's got incredibly long, sharp teeth. looks like the most savage thing you've ever seen. And it's a, it eats fruit. That's all it eats is fruit. Well, mm. think about a, a giant panda. Now, a giant panda mainly eats bamboo, and you need real sharp teeth for that. You look at its teeth and you say, wow, it must have been a savage animal. Well, it eats mainly bamboo. Most bears, even though bears will eat, you know, small animals and so on, and but most bears primarily eat berries. They'll even eat grass after coming out of hibernation. And, you know, there was a... There was, uh, it was on the Discovery Channel, I believe, where I've got the video of it. In Australia, somebody did a test, a bait test on sharks and the great white shark, and they put out squid and uh, they put out uh, brown seaweed as well, and they, they put out uh, another animal. Um, and so uh, what happened, the great white shark came along and he took the, the, the brown... Uh, algae, the seaweed, he took the plant first and then second came back for it and then came back later and ate the squid and so on. In Ooh. other words, yeah, they will eat plants too. The, I've got a video huh. of, a, of an alligator in Florida eating kumquats off a tree. Um, so I say huh. that to say, you know, <clears throat> there are animals today that certainly eat other animals. There are some animals that eat primarily uh, uh, fruit and so on and plants, but but We'll maybe occasionally eat another animal. We, we're living in a fallen world. Originally, yeah. it was not like that. And even though things look like they're designed today, in a sense, uh, to you know eat other animals or whatever, we've got to remember they could possibly, isn't it possible there's something we don't know where they could have used it for a different function? Like mm -hmm. mosquitoes. You say, well, mosquitoes suck blood. Well, the female sucks blood. The male a mosquito sucks uh, plant, plant sap. Is it possible they all suck plant sap originally before sin? Mm. So you see, there's yeah. lots of different ways of interpreting that. And I don't have all the answers uh, because I've never seen a perfect world. I've a, I was born in an imperfect world. I was born in a fallen world. I've grown up in this. It all seems, it, it, it all seems so normal in one sense, but it's abnormal in a biblical sense. Yeah. And that's what we've got to understand. Yes. Indeed. Great. That's helpful. Thank you, Ken. So, uh, I, I, yeah. And maybe, Justin, I'll say one other thing. Yeah, if, uh, if Some of those people then come back and say, well, plants die then. They're eating plants. Well, there's a Hebrew phrase, nefesh. That's a life spirit yeah. that animals that's have right. that plants do not. That's right. right? There, there's something different about plant death. I mean, you know, if, if, if you were to take your wife or your girlfriend out, you know, on a hike and say, let's sit here and watch the sunset, and you sat on a a dead tree lying there, uh, you could have a romantic evening, but you wouldn't say to her, let's sit on that dead rotting deer over there and <laughs> enjoy the sunset. There's something different about animal death. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Good point. 
Uh, the other question, Ken, so Genesis 4 records the birth of Cain and Abel, uh, and then Cain's murder of his brother. And then just a few verses later in the same chapter, uh, Cain is building a city that he named Enoch, that he named, of course, after his, after his son. So some have asked me, well, how, how do you go from Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and then just in a few verses after Abel is dead, so you're left with Adam and Eve and Cain, now he's building a city. Where, where did all these people come from? Yeah. Um, so first of all, we really need to understand that uh, God doesn't give us everything uh, in, in his word. Correct. Uh, everything that happened, all the details. In fact, Correct. if God told us everything, we'd have an infinite number of books and we'd never get through them. That's right. Um, but he's given us the relevant information we need to have. If you think about it, uh, Genesis... Um, 1 to 11 covers, what, 1,700 years of history, you know, from creation to the flood. And it's, yeah. it's just a summary uh, there. Now we have, some, we have some specific details in Genesis 5, for instance, of all the different generations. But you know, I, I wish the Bible gave us more history about what sort of houses did they build and what happened and, you know, yeah. all the other history. But, you know, there's enough there, nonetheless, for us to answer even these questions like the ones you ask. For instance, first of all, Genesis 5.4 says, and Adam had other sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, from reading scripture, it seems very obvious that Cain was the first child. Now, when did Adam have Seth? That was when he was 130 years old. So that was 130 years later. Now, when God made Adam and Eve, he told them to be fruitful and multiply. If they obeyed, Cain could have been born could have been born back there, you know, very close to the beginning, right? Certainly, yeah. I believe after the fall, which I think was very quick. Right. Uh, I don't think that took a long time. Right. So when Cain killed Abel, he could have been close to 130 years old, if you think about it. Mm. Now, um, yeah. you know, Seth is said to be a replacement for Abel. Uh, that's what Eve seems to say, that he's a replacement for Abel. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that would mean uh, when uh, Cain killed Abel, so um, maybe Seth uh, was was very, very... Uh, you know, Seth was born, then his replacement for Abel. So how old was Abel when Cain killed him? Well, we don't know. And where is he in that um, genealogical line? But we're not told all the details. We're not told all the other sons and daughters. Um, so it's very possible that Abel was very young. He could have been a teenager maybe or yeah. in his 20s or whatever. Sure. Now, there's another aspect of this. You know, when Cain killed Abel, it says that Cain went out and knew his wife. And people say, where did he get his wife from? Well, knew his wife implies he was already married. Already married, yeah. So if you think about it, if he was close to, you know, 130 years old when he killed Abel, and marriage is one man for one woman, and we all come from Adam and Eve, there could have been a lot of children who were already married and had children Right. And including Cain. Right. And so there was a lot of family members there, many more than we realize. See, that that little phrase in Genesis 5-4 is important. Adam had other sons and daughters. And only three are singled out, particularly mm -hmm. Cain and Abel, and for the particular reason that Cain killed Abel, and there's a lot of teaching in there for us. And then Seth uh, is singled out because... Uh, and and there's a godly line that comes from Seth, and because Eve saw him as a replacement for um, for Abel, uh, so you know put all that together, uh, who was Cain frightened of? Uh, when the scripture says you know, mm -hmm. if, if, but when people see me, they'll kill me. He was frightened of his other family members, which is why God yeah. gave him some sign, whatever it was, that right. uh, that no, they're not going to kill you, um, and you know, gave a warning about that. And I think that's important because um, when you look at all the laws of the Old Testament and so on, when people had to be judged by being put to death, their fa close family members were not to be the ones involved and so on. So I think there's a lot there in regard to that whole family relationship. And then he went out and built a city and probably already had 
uh, children and uh, wanted some fortification maybe to keep himself safe, yeah. even yeah. though God said, um, you know, that's not going to happen. But uh, I hope that answers the question. I, I think when you when you read this very, very carefully and put it in context, you start to realize, oh, yeah. Now, a lot of people, oh, I haven't thought about that before. Uh, that They just think, I remember once when I was in a, a restaurant in London, in England, and the chef heard we doing a conference nearby, and he came over and said, I heard you people are doing a conference on the Bible. I said, yeah. He said, well, I don't believe the Bible. I said, why not? Well, he said, the Bible says God made Adam and Eve, and then they had Cain and Abel. Where do all the people come from then? And I, I showed him the Bible. And I said, Genesis 5, 4 says Adam had sons and daughters. And he said, yep. oh, I didn't read that far. And, you know, that's the problem with a lot of people. They don't read that far. That's right. Uh, so yep. there are answers to these questions if we read them. And, you know, that there's an important lesson for us to learn from Cain and Abel, and that is God called Cain. Cain... Cain was angry at his brother Abel, mm -hmm. and uh, he there was something about the sacrifice. Could be that you know Abel didn't bring the right sacrifice, but uh, there was jealousy there. He had anger in his heart, and this is the important thing for us to know. God said to him, "Sin desires you. Sin sin yes. wants to master over you, mm -hmm. uh, but you need to master over it. Don't let that happen." And he let his sin master over him, and he killed Abel. And yeah. that's a warning for each one of us. Our sin nature wants to master over us every day. And that's yes. why we need to continually look to God's word and look to the Lord Jesus Christ to be conformed to his image so that we don't let it master over us every day. We can't trust our feelings. See, the young people today are being told, trust your feelings. And, oh, I feel I want to be a girl or a boy. Or I can change or whatever. No, you've got to judge your feelings, your behavior, uh, everything you believe against the absolute authority of God's word. That's why it's so important to stand on the absolute authority of God's word and to know God's word. Amen. Amen. Excellent. That's very helpful, Ken. Thank you. Um, Ken, one of the, one of the things that I've really appreciated about you is that you are, you are um, willing to engage some of the most egregious and dangerous false teachings out there. And quite honestly, I've told other people, I said, I can't believe Ken is still on Twitter. I guess it's now X, but I figured you would have been kicked off a long time ago, but uh, you're so courageous and you engage these things. And, and, uh, and, and you've also done so thankfully uh, to some of the more dangerous teachings within Christianity. And I want to ask you, um, I, I think going back to about 2015, if I'm not mistaken, you have called Andy Stanley a false teacher. Uh, Andy Stanley is a pastor of one of the larger churches in the United States, and he has famously or infamously said that we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Um, he said that, uh, and I quote, we believe Jesus rose from the dead, but we don't believe Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible tells us so. It's actually the other way around. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, there would be no Bible, there would be no church, and I would have no job. So why, why, have, you, why have you called Andy Stanley a false teacher? What, what makes his teaching so dangerous? Well, you know, for Andy Stanley... Uh, if you listen to his sermons more and more, one of the things that I've always said, and I'm, I, we're starting to see this more and more with him too, even some of his statements dealing with the LGBT issues and the way mm -hmm. he gets around those and yeah. soft on those and so on. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it really comes down to once you give up Genesis 1 to 11, ultimately you will see that impacting how you view the rest of Scripture. Uh, and... He certainly doesn't believe in Genesis 1 to 11 as literal history. He believes in the Big Bang. He believes in billions of years. Um, he yep. says when it comes down to what he calls science in the Bible, he says science must win. Uh, you know, he's got wow. that uh, statement in one of his sermons. And when religion and science conflict, at the end of the day, if you are an honest person, science must win. And what he's talking about science, wow. he's talking about millions of years and evolution and, yeah. and uh, that sort of thing. And so... You know, when he says you have to unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament, well, then the Old Testament is foundational to the New Testament. Or you could say the New Testament is all uh, founded in the Old Testament. 
And all of that's founded in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. So once you unhitch that from the Old Testament, you have no foundation for what's in the New Testament. That's right. And, you know, what he's really doing is undermining the authority of the Word of God. He's attacking uh, the Word of God. I mean, how many times do you even read in the New Testament where they're saying, you know, and Christ rose, you know, according to the Scriptures? Mm -hmm. uh, or you think about when Jesus was asked about marriage, in Matthew 19, it's recorded in Mark 10 as well. Well, have you not read, uh, you know, uh, talking about the authority of, of the written word? Or when mm -hmm. Jesus was tempted by the devil, what did he say? It is, written. it is written. And then the devil even said it is written, but he quoted it, misquoted it, quoted out of context. Then Jesus said, but yeah. it is written. Uh, again, the authority uh, of the word of God. And uh, so, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to the resurrection, let, let me let me ask a, a question. You know, as a Christian, how do we know Jesus rose from the dead? How do we ultimately know? Do we see it happen? No. Do we have a movie rerun of it? No. So how do we know? We only know because God has told us in his word. That's how we know. Right. You, you can't know that apart from scripture. You can have all this circumstantial evidence. And I mean, you know, you could look at Josh McDowell's worth, who did some great work on, you know, apologetics in regard to uh, the resurrection, for instance. And there's others who have done this and who point to all sorts of different sources and so on. And that may be true, but that still doesn't prove Jesus rose from the dead. That's right. The only way we know Jesus rose from the dead ultimately um, is because uh, the scripture tells us. I mean, how do, we, how do we know Jesus healed a blind man? Because the Bible says. That's right. How do we know he, rose, he raised Lazarus from the dead? The Bible says. How do we know that he fed thousands is a miracle? The Bible says. How do we know Jesus was born of a virgin? The Bible says. How do you know anything ultimately as a Christian? The Bible says. Right. Uh, and so, um, you know, Andy Stanley is really attacking God's word, undermining the authority of the word of God, which means he's attacking the person of Jesus Christ, who is exactly. the word. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. These are the the the, the compromises that Andy Stanley is making. There, th these are not secondary issues. You know, this is not. We're not talking about matters that we can have differences of opinion on and still have fellowship in Christ. You know, your eschatology, who wrote the book of Hebrews, these kinds of things. He's undermining the very gospel itself. He is. And, you know, that brings to mind a time when I was uh, being interviewed by a Presbyterian minister. And he said to me, now, you agree in the church we can have different views of eschatology, uh, you know, pre-mill, post-mill, i mill. We can have different True. views of modes of baptism, different views of speaking in tongue, different views of Sabbath day, and so on. And I said, yeah, that's true. And obviously somebody's wrong because <laughs> they all can't be right. But but right. nonetheless, yes, that's true. And yep. he said, and we have different views of Genesis, same thing. I said, no, 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 no. No, it's not the same thing. You know, when you're arguing about views of eschatology and modes of baptism and so on, primarily you're arguing from Scripture and you're saying, well, Scripture says this. Well, over here it says this. Yeah, but here it says this. Ah, but we've got to interpret Scripture as Scripture and here it says this and mm -hmm. look at this. But when it comes to... Uh, different views of Genesis, it's not because look what Scripture says, it's, but look what man is saying. Look what man yeah. is saying outside yeah. of here. That's uh, right. That's that It's coming from outside of Scripture. Yeah. And, you know, with Andy Stanley, he's made it very clear that he takes man's views from outside of Scripture uh, and then adds them to the Bible. Well, actually, I'm not sure what he's adding them to because he sort of doesn't really believe the Bible or, yeah, that's right. or, or he's rejecting the Old Testament um, but as I said, once you reject Genesis 1 to 11 as literal history, the rest will ultimately fall. You'll start to see it happen in various ways. And another way I make that statement is, hey, uh, if you believe in Genesis 1 to 11 as literal history, that's the key to being woke proof. Yes, that's right. I like because that. I'll, that's right. Uh, you always find when people are soft on all these other issues, yeah. they will not take Genesis one to eleven as literal history. Once you take Genesis one to eleven as literal history, marriage is a man and a woman. There's only two genders, and so it goes that's on. Right. That's how to be woke proof. That's exactly right, Ken. I agree a hundred percent. Yep. You compromise on Genesis one through eleven. The camel's nose is under the tent, and the rest of that camel's coming up. It's coming in with it. So um, that's for sure. 
Yep, absolutely. 100%, 100%. Thank you so much for that. So, Ken, I've been to the um I've been to the ARC now four times. I've been to the Creation Museum, I think, three. Uh, every time I go, there's there's something new, which I, I want to ask you about in just a second. But a couple of my favorite exhibits at the Creation Museum, I love the planetarium. I think that is phenomenal. Uh, Jason Lyle has helped design that and write the script for that, correct? Uh, yeah, for the uh, Creative Cosmos program. We have a number of programs, but that's our premier program, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And I also love the, and this is my wife's favorite exhibit, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Um, that's the most um, powerful pro-life exhibit in the world. 100%. I've never seen anything like it. For, for those who haven't yet seen it, uh, tell us a little bit about that exhibit, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Well, that exhibit... Um, was really um, produced on the basis of some great teaching by the late Dr. Dave Menton, the wonderful man of God. He was a, an anatomist. And so they were able to uh, produce models uh, showing the development of a child in the womb right from fertilization. We even have some what are called Pepper's, Pepper's Ghost animation to show you things there as well. And these models are exquisite. There's nothing else like them anywhere. We searched the yeah. world, couldn't find models that uh, we the high enough quality. And so we have our own design team, sculptors and artists and so on, and they designed all these models. And as you go through, you can see uh, the development of a baby right from fertilization uh, because life begins at fertilization, a unique yes. combination of information. Yep. Uh, abortion is killing a human being right from fertilization. Yep. And then we uh, go and, and show people that and the development at various stages and all the organs and so on. And uh, then we also have a giant baby, which is exquisitely done and showing the work of the placenta, which is one of the most astonishing, amazing organs uh, in the mm -hmm. human body. And uh, then we go through and deal with all sorts of issues in regard to uh, development uh, in the womb and then abortion and then testimonies from uh, from people uh, who, are, who, are, who are premie babies born when they're yes. not supposed to survive outside the womb and have yeah. done, or from a lady who was a twin and her twin was aborted and they tried to abort her and she wasn't, and now she goes lecturing all around the world. We have wonderful uh, testimonies there. Uh, we have all sorts of fascinating information. And, uh, and, and you know, at the end of that exhibit, uh, we also have a challenge uh, to people to really um, think about their own lives and what has happened. And we make sure they understand because we have people who go through their men and women who've been involved in abortion and they're in tears as they go through and realize what, what they've done. Yeah. And we want to remind them that God is a loving, gracious, forgiving, merciful right. God. And yeah. he promises to forgive our sins, to remove them as far as the East is from the West and so on. Yep. And so it's also got forgiveness in there, but it's an incredible exhibit. Nothing else like it in the world. No, indeed. Uh, and that's just one exhibit of the many exhibits we have at the Creation Museum. Yes, indeed. Indeed. I, it, it is so profoundly moving. Um, anyone who has not yet seen it, um, I very much encourage you go to the Creation Museum, see this. I don't know how any person... Uh, any person who is not, at least someone who has not yet been completely given over to a depraved mind, I don't know how they could go through that exhibit and come out on the other end anything but 100% pro-life. It, it's right. just, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yep. Well, Ken, what what are the future plans? I, I hinted a second ago, every, every time I go to the Creation Museum or the Ark, there's something new. I see some construction going on behind you right now so what what have you what's in the oh, we're we're always on the move you don't want to stay still i mean you yeah. know i'm always talking to people about what's the next thing we're going to do before we even finish what we're doing but uh there's <laughs> right. a lot more people out there to impact with the message of god's word and the gospel here at the creation museum actually behind me we're building a whole new zoo uh we were donated money for a massive stage to do live animal programs out there at the zoo Wow. And we're also building, it'll be the largest glass conservatory in the state of Kentucky, housing um, permanent display of plants. And we're going to be raising the plants of the Bible in there. Mm. And we've got a classroom or two classrooms to go with that, uh, where we'll also have some educational teaching as well. 
Uh, down at the Ark, we're building right now a welcome centre, a new welcome centre. This The funds of this were donated last year, or the year before, actually, and also a big building to house. It'll be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, mo indoor model of Jerusalem in the world. It'll be certainly wow. the most up-to-date archaeologically, and it's going to be exquisite, and we're going to follow through the life of Christ, and uh, it's going to be absolutely stunning. Uh, we also just installed a... Uh, an exhibit on actually two exhibits on the third deck of the ark one uh, is a torah scroll that was donated to us a decommissioned torah scroll and we unwound it from oh. genesis to exodus and wow. uh, we have a lot um, in regard to teaching of how the scripture was uh, was transmitted uh, down you know generation after generation yeah. and then we also have an exhibit on the arcs of the world where somebody went around the world and they bought arcs in countries all over the world because everyone's heard of Noah's Ark. And even though oh. a lot of them are little bathtub arcs and all the rest of it, uh, yeah. it's an exquisite collection. And we've got it there with our flood legends exhibit because it fits with the fact that there are flood legends all over the world and people yeah, have yeah. heard yeah. Uh, of the flood. Um, we right. also are bringing more and more programs into the Answer Center. You know, you, you've you spoken at uh, a pastor's conference in the past. You've been there for uh, a, a few times. Yeah. Um, and, of course, we hope to have you back uh, again because uh, people uh, love you uh, speaking. That's and great. Then, um, I would love to. We, uh, we actually uh, brought in, we're going to bring them back in in November, a theatre group from uh, down in South Carolina who did The Horse and His Boy uh, from the Chronicles of Narnia, okay. uh, which was really uh, stunningly done. And then in January, they're going to do Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, we have the biggest Christian music uh, festival in the world at the Ark Encounter, 40 days of continuous concerts. And we do all sorts of other conferences and teaching programs. Our women's conference this year uh, booked out real quickly at 2,000, nearly 2,000 women. And so then we were doing a second one in the same week. So we're doing two women's conferences in the same week with wow. the same speakers. Uh, so we're doing all sorts of things there. We have educational programs for children and for, for young people, we have a couple of science labs where we teach them science programs. We also have at the Ark, we have a virtual reality experience, mm -hmm. and we have yep. a carousel, and we have a zoo at the back of the Ark as well. And we have zip lines at both locations. People say, why do you have zip lines? Well, Christians can have fun too. That's right. Uh, so <laughs> we, we, you can tell we're always doing things, and these are, and of course at the Ark, we have the life-size Ark, which is uh, the biggest freestanding timber frame structure in the world and filled with 130 exhibits in all three decks. So yeah. they're amazing places, the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world. It is amazing. It's just mind-boggling. It's 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 hard to comprehend all that y'all have done there. I should say all that God has done through you there. It's just amazing. And uh, anybody who has not yet been to the Creation Museum and or the art, do yourself a favor. Um, don't plan on seeing it all in one day either there's a lot of stuff there so can't thank yeah, you minimum of three days <laughs> minimum yeah i would say so minimum of three days absolutely absolutely uh your time will be much better spent going to the ark and the creation museum than disney world um, absolutely ditch mickey mouse go see the ark go see the creation yeah. museum <laughs> yeah ditch the woke place come to the non-woke place exactly 100 percent. 100 percent well, Ken, uh, as we close out, brother, can I get you to just close us with a short gospel presentation? Well, you know, if I'm going to give a gospel presentation, uh, Justin, you know where we should start? We should start with the book of Genesis. And the reason is because we have the foundations to understand the gospel right there. In fact, the first time the gospel was ever preached is Genesis 3.15, yep. where God promised a savior. Because of our sin, because we in Adam sinned against God, death came into the world. And then that means we're separated from God spiritually and our bodies die. But that's not the end of us. The scripture makes it clear. After death comes a judgment. Uh, so as sinners, we can't live with a holy God. But God back there in Genesis 3.15 promised that someone would come who would crush the serpent, who would... Mm. Uh, pay the penalty for our sin, be raised from the dead, and offer a free gift of salvation. And so Genesis sets the foundation. Uh, who made us? What our problem is? Sin. 
Uh, the consequence of that, our bodies die. Everyone's going to die. Everyone watching this program is going to die. Yeah. But it's your body that dies. It's a tent that you live in, but the real you isn't going to die. And the Bible says that if you have received a free gift of salvation because God promised a savior and that savior came 4,000 years later, actually, yeah. uh, after creation, a savior came, uh, God stepped into history as a man uh, to be the babe in a manger, the God man, the perfect man, because a man brought sin and death into the world. A man would have to pay the penalty for sin and death, but it can't be one of us. We're sinners. So yeah. God stepped into history in the person of his son to be the perfect man, to pay the penalty for sin, death on the cross. He conquered the devil, and but he was raised from the dead. He has ultimate power. And for those who put their faith and trust in him, uh, then receive a free gift of salvation, then when we die, we spend eternity with him. And the Bible has a warning that if you have not received that free gift of salvation, it says there'll be a second death. That second death is eternal separation from God. And that's why I always say to people, the Bible talks about Christians being born again, born again of the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. uh, to put our faith and trust in him. If you're not born again, if you're not born if you're not born twice, you're born as a human and then born yeah. again, the Spirit of God. If you're not born twice, uh, the Bible says um, uh, we, you will have a second death. You'll die right. twice. But if you're born again, you only die once and That's then right. go to spend eternity with him. And I pray that everyone understands if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you believe God has raised him from the dead, you repent of your, your sin, receive that free gift of salvation, you'll be saved for eternity. No one can take it away from you. And you will know, that's what the scripture says, you will know uh, that you have eternal life with the Lord yep. Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. There's no other important message in the entire universe. Amen and amen. Amen. Ken, thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, we appreciate you so very much. We give the Lord praise for what he's done through you and through all of the fine folks there at Answers in Genesis. And may God, may God increase your reach, brother. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Justin. You're so We'll welcome. see you again out here at the Arkham Museum. I look forward to that. I sure okay. do. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching, dear ones. Until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all.